we've covered a lot of fire lays in the last few weeks. Throughout that we've done some cook fires, some warming drying fires, some detail fires like last week's lean-to fire which is the ignition fire. This one is almost exclusively an artisanal and cooking fire. This is the one fire that you don't see too often anymore but it is one of the most useful fires I've come across through all of my readings and research. This fire has a lot of names. <laughs> I mean a lot of names. And there's a lot of different ways to set it up. The one name that goes by out west is the crisscross fire. Another name for it is the star fire because of all the radiance or radiations coming out from it. It can also be called the sunburst fire, starburst fire, and most often the Indian fire. Now, the term Indian fire has two different histories it's because in many parts of India, this is also used there uh, for cooking. Putting their large clay pots on top of this kind of a fire is very easy to do. But also the first peoples of Canada and the United States of America had this fire often as well. So the name Indian fire can, uh, can be involved with either the actual people of India or the First Nations of North America. The Indian fire or star fire, which I'm going to be calling it throughout the rest of this video, is a very intriguing fire because it has a lot of benefits and a lot of detriments. <laughs> There's a lot of both. Some fires, they're very stable, but they don't cook very well. Or they don't burn very well. Others are burning very brightly, but they're very unstable. Others are too hot to be able to cook at. This one, the main detriments are it takes a long time to get it going properly. That's the biggest trick. We lit this fire probably about an hour and a half ago to get it to this point, and we're still not fully ready to use this fire. What is going to happen is you need to burn through all the logs you put on it until they're all nice and level before you can cook on top of this fire. This fire becomes a very stable platform once it's ready, but it takes a while. We're dealing with logs that are twice as thick as my wrists here, so it's going to take a while to burn through them. The main log, this real big one on top, it's been burning for the longest. I think it was one of the first logs we put on once we started putting the big fuel on, and we're not even all the way to one-third through it. That's one of the biggest issues. It takes a while to, before you can actually use this fire. The catch to it is, you can still stay warm by it, you can still cook around it, you can still use the fire, you just can't put big pots on it yet. Another big detriment is, it's kind of haphazard. It spreads out quite a bit. As you can see, we've probably got a radius here of seven feet all the way around, which means we have a diameter of at least 14, maybe even 15 feet in some directions. With these logs going in so many different directions, you gotta be careful where you're stepping. This is not a good fire to have at night. People start tripping and they get hurt very easily. Another big detriment is it can spread out rapidly without your knowledge. It's not the kind of fire you want to leave alone for long. Uh, one year we were demonstrating this fire inside of a, a very large shelter. And I mean a very large shelter. It was big enough to shelter at least 12 people. And we had it going. We stepped outside to demonstrate another fire. It was actually a very small version of this. And about 15 minutes later, the walls of the shelter lit up. Now this is about, uh, I'd say nine, ten years ago. So it's quite a while, a while back that it happened. I was pretty young in my times of working with these kinds of fires, but it went up quick. It, it, without anyone observing, the coals and the flames kind of crept along the bottom of the logs, got out to this duff that was around inside the shelter, and went up. We lost two walls of that shelter within about five minutes. We couldn't put it all out in time. The biggest detriment though is the amount of work it takes to take care of this fire. It doesn't want to go at the beginning. You have a lot of kindling put in, you start burning, you start putting bigger sticks on, you start putting bigger sticks on, and it kind of looks like a haphazard log cabin fire as you go. But as you get up, the logs that are getting higher and higher away from the fire, some people will just keep on stacking it until it's like four feet in the air with only a couple of logs up there, there's not enough fuel mixed with the air and not enough heat mixed with that fuel and air to get it burning well. Fire needs all three, fuel, heat, and air. You need that fire triangle to make it burn well. The lower the fire is, the more stable it is, but the more focused the heat is. If you have your logs stacked way up high, it's not gonna burn well. The solution to that is you make a teepee fire around the core of your star fire. Now the benefits, there's quite a few. 
first and foremost, because I'm throwing in long logs like this, I don't need to cut them. In an emergency situation, I have to burn a bunch of material to get it shaped. Or if I have to cut a bunch of material to build a structure, whether it's a shelter or potentially a log raft, if I end up having to do that, I don't want to have to use my axe day in and day out, especially in an emergency situation. I'm going to be under stress. I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be thirsty. I'm going to be hungry. I may have injuries or maybe cold out. I don't really want to be swinging an axe too much in that situation. I can let the fire do the work for me. Burn the wood in half, and then I can continue to work how I need. If I need two logs that are, let's say, five feet long each, and I got a 12 foot long log, I put it in the middle of the fire, burn it in half, and now I got two five foot long logs. Sure, two of the end, uh, one of the ends is gonna be burnt on each one of those, but who cares? Those are the ends I can hide away by burying them in the ground for a structure, or really it doesn't matter. I'm not going for looks in a survival situation. The other benefit is the fact that I can just keep pushing my fuel in. I don't even have to get up. I can just keep pushing them in together. I'm actually sitting on one of my fuel logs right now. I just keep adjusting it. I don't have to keep going out and getting more small pieces of wood and keep putting them on my little fire. I can keep putting them back in. One of the coolest versions of this can actually be seen in Morskohansky's Bushcraft book where he has a shelter with three people sleeping in between three big logs and a small fire in the center. And they just keep feeding those logs in as they sleep. A, you got two walls right there focusing the heat right to your body from the two logs. B, each person has one log right by their head they can just push in. So everybody has one job to do throughout the night. It's not one person in a teepee or one person in a yurt or in a wigwam or in a in any kind of you know winter shelter, enclosed shelter, having to take care of the fire on their own. It's everybody working together and everybody being responsible together. So it kind of helps keep everybody happy that way. The other benefit to star fires is the fact that, as I said, it's a cooking fire. It's a very good cooking fire. Once this is all burnt down and we have a nice level coal bed, I have all these logs in one spot that I can brace my pot on top of. Now for this fire, we're going to use a very big pot. I can't necessarily put my little bush pot on top of all this. That'd be almost, well, that would be overkill by definition. But I can put a large wash basin on here in case I'm trying to boil down stains like hemlock bark or walnut husk. If I'm trying to cook a large meal for a large group of people like chicken and rice or a big pot of chili, I can put it around top of one of these and let it cook all day long. It's a very good way to be able to cook large meals for long periods. So stews, chilies, rice dishes, whatever it may be, I can keep it going on a nice platform like this. And if it's starting to get overheated, guess what? pull the logs out and it starts to die down in heat. Push them back in as I want to ra uh, raise temperature. That one's going to be kind of odd because I'm sitting on it. So that's the main benefit of the Starfire. The other thing when it comes down to the Starfire is because we have a focus point of heat, it's a very good way to heat things for artisanal crafts. If I'm trying to fire harden a uh, stick for digging sticks or spear shafts or arrow, uh, arrow shafts, this is a very easy way to focus the heat in one spot, put my stick into the ground underneath it or into the ash underneath it and harden it that way. If I'm trying to truncate a tree with nothing but stone technologies, it's much easier to cut that stick in half by just burning through instead of trying to chop through with my stone axe or stone knife. This is a very good way to cut things in half. Another way of looking at this for, uh, for traditional crafts is the fact that this is a very good controllable fire for certain things like making pitch glue, such as spruce gum glue, pine gum glue, uh, birch tar glues, things like that. This is a small fire that I can control and manipulate. And yes, even though it looks big right now, this is considered a small fire. This is not throwing out a huge amount of heat. I'm not sweating, I'm not overheated at all. In fact, because it's a wet, cold day, I've actually got a chill going on right now. I'm not really warmed up by this fire. It's a small fire. Even though it looks large, that's just because there's a lot of ash right now. The main focus of heat is right where those three flames are right in the middle. Nothing else is really burning. We're just pushing the coals in as we go and letting the fire do its job.